Good evening and welcome to another in the series of Get the Facts. I am your host, William Neal, and I'd just like to remind you that this is a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Wellness and this station, Channel 5. Of course, we're getting a 360 perspective on COVID over the series. And tonight, we're going to be focusing on exactly how COVID affects your mental health. But before we get into the show, we'd like to review our numbers. Of course, we're going over the last week. I also need to remind you that this is an interactive show, so we encourage you to submit your questions via Channel 5's Facebook live stream, either video or by text right there, and you can do it with a hashtag, get the facts. Let's get into the numbers for the last week. This is for the week of August 30th to tonight, September 6th. COVID-19 fig figures, total tests reported, 13,422. Total positive cases reported, 938. Our total deaths for the last week, six. We'd like to extend our condolences to all those families who have lost someone to COVID-19. In terms of vaccination data, Friday, August 30 to September 6, 2021, total vaccinated for the week, 16,053. Total single vaccinated for the week, 9,678. Total fully vaccinated for the week, 6,375. Our cumulative data, total vaccinated from the start of our vaccination campaign, 172,063. Total fully vaccinated, 75,094. Total vaccination of children, 12 to 17, Total vaccinated, 14,151. Those are our COVID numbers for this week. And we're moving directly into our show. And our first guest joins me via Zoom. It's Dr. Anel Martinez, who is a psychiatrist. Good night, doctor, and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great being here. Now, let's focus a little bit when we're talking about uh, our mental health. Let's start off by talking about in your personal capacity, professional capacity, sorry. Have you been seeing uh, patients that have simply been overwhelmed by what's happening with COVID and life in general and what that uh, adds up to in terms of, uh, you know, making decisions on a daily basis, especially decisions that can affect their mental health. Okay. So I have definitely seen an increase in patients who have come in with COVID-related um, mental health disturbances or disorders. Um, reason why is because there are several patients who have come in for care with new psychiatric symptoms since maybe 2020 um, up to 2021. And of course, there are patients who have had prior to um, the pandemic psychiatric disorders or disturbances, which have been aggravated by the um, world situation on the state that we are in and all the changes that they have had to undergo because of the pandemic. So there are people who are worsening and there are people who are new cases to mental health. Now, let's get into some specifics. What are some of the uh, emerging mental health challenges that people may endure as a result of the entire COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis that comes along with it? 
At the top of our list, of course, is anxiety. And make no mistake, this was already at the top of the list before the pandemic, so that is worsening. Um, we're seeing also depressive symptoms, sleep disorders, um, increase in substance abuse, and levels of stress. And you will notice that I make a distinction between anxiety symptoms and stress. And the reason why is because those who are suffering from stress, this is due to an external factor which is beyond their control. And once that situation or that problem is resolved, the stress level tends to go away and there's a recovery to a sense of normalcy. However, if there is chronic stress, which is expected as we have been one year and a half or more into this pandemic, then that can then result in um, anxiety. And anxiety is more an internal experience um, of a constant sense of impending doom or that something is going to go wrong. And with that comes several physical, psychological and behavioral um, symptoms. So definitely, those are what we are seeing so far. And of course, in cases of um, patients who have been hospitalized or in ICU because they have contracted the virus, we are also seeing cases of acute stress and PTSD, along with depression and anxiety. Now, I want to ask a question in terms of uh, stress. You're talking about stress. A lot of people lost their jobs, for example. So is that the driving force, the uncertainty of the uh, world of work? Or is it uh, triggered by other causes? Primarily, what I'm seeing is stress induced by the fear of the unknown, which is the um, case of the COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then secondary to that is um, job insecurity, um, changes in work situations, in educational setting, um, having to adjust to working from home or maybe one of the um, providers in the home having lost their jobs, whether temporarily or um, permanently. And so those would be the driving factors that we are seeing so far, which result in stressful situations. For people who have contracted the virus, those who have had to be in isolation or quarantined, um, we also notice there's a high stress level in them. Not to forget, first and foremost, the um, frontline health workers who are exposed to the virus more than some of us are because of the nature of their jobs. These people have also experienced an increase in stress level, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, sleep disorder, and not to mention the people who are taking a 10% cut on top of job instability. So there are a lot of stressors indeed. Now, I want you to um, look at the gender uh, you know, disparities if there are any, between male and female. I know globally, we've seen that more women have been mis uh, displaced from the workplace as a result of uh, the challenges of you know, having to take care of the children at home or uh, doing homeschooling, etc. Is that the same trend in, ter in terms of uh, mental uh, challenges? Are we seeing Definitely. a greater number among women? Definitely, that has always been the case that um, more women would suffer from mental illness compared to men. But women have also been put in a very unique situation as we are facing this pandemic. Um, as they tend to be more responsible with interaction with the children, with looking after the, um, the home itself. Um, if we're looking also at single parent home, majority of those homes are being held down by, by mothers and women in general. And so you can imagine the extreme amount of demand that is being placed on these women, not just to be carers for their family, but now to be educators to their children, um, providers in the home. What if they have had to adjust to a salary loss or adjustment? Um, so definitely we're still seeing that. Mostly women are being affected as opposed to men. Now, when you have these types of uh, difficult situations where you find that people 
because there are so many external unknown factors. How do you counsel someone in that regard to manage their stress that could eventually lead to anxiety? So managing stress, again, I guess we can look at, just to simplify it, we can look at the basic things that we do for our physical health which is making sure that we're staying active, getting physical activity in at least every day. Um, and that could be in any form. It could be going to the um, gym for those that are open now. It could be taking a walk in the neighborhood. It could be jogging. It could be swimming, bike riding, playing some kind of sport, aerobic exercise inside, yoga, Zumba, um, for those who like to dance, just to a regular dance workout can also help to um, enhance your mood and improve your sleep. Making sure that you're sleeping adequate hours. For majority of the population, we need at least seven hours of sleep at night. So try to get in good sleep. Um, making sure that we're eating healthy, um, getting your fruits and your vegetables, consume a decent amount of water, at least eight cups for the day. And then an important as doing exercise and sleeping is staying connected, socially connected, whether via virtual means, which is the most advisable at this point, um, checking in on family members. If you know anybody who is also struggling, you know, reach out to that person, making sure that you have a support system of someone that you can call or a group of people that you can call on when you are in distress or you're feeling overwhelmed being certain that you are assertive enough to ask for what you need, recognize when you're stuck in a situation, recognize when you're struggling with something before you crash and ask for help. Don't be ashamed. At this point, all of us are stressed and frustrated and a lot of times angry, um, very irritable. And so we're all going through the same process but reacting in our own different ways. But if we're at least able to reach out to someone to check in on them or reach for it when we need the help, that's very much advisable. For those who are in treatment or physical or psychological, psychiatric disorders, then making sure that you're keeping up with your treatment as best as possible, looking after your health. For those who are in therapy and have access to it, go to your therapy sessions. For those who don't have access, look for resources. There's a lot of resources online that we can use, and a lot of us have internet, so we're on social media all day. As we use social media, it could be a medium for us to also seek good advice as to how to cope with our specific situations. Now, you're saying some of these uh, things, and they're, ver they're excellent ideas, but when you're in the midst of uh, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, you know, and the dark cloud is hanging over you, um, the last thing you're thinking about is actually uh, talking to people. As simple as that may sound, you tend to close off entirely. At what point should an individual uh, say, hey, I need some help? Very well. So social isolation is one of the first signs of um, stress or depression and anxiety. Sorry. And so um, there is also a tendency to feel like nobody understands what I'm going through or how is it going to sound if I start to complain about what I'm going through? Um, or we, we tend to doubt that how we feel is valid in a situation. And if you are a person having any of these thoughts or something similar, then this is a time that you least need to be isolated. This is when you have to reach out to someone. And I know that a lot of people are afraid of being judged because of how they feel or they're afraid that they're going to be stigmatized or categorized if they express how they feel. But now more than ever, considering that we can all identify with to some extent with your experience, I urge you to reach out to someone you trust, to someone that will con you can confide in um, and who will not judge you harshly about what you want to say and what you're thinking of reaching out about. How can you be kind to yourself in such a situation? Because this has been an extended period of stress. And for a lot of people, you know, 
you're just being hard on yourself or you can be extremely hard on yourself because you feel like, come on, I should be doing better at this. Mm. This is not unique to me. Everyone is having these challenges, so to speak. I think if we start to speak up, we will recognize and realize that it's not an isolated situation. We're not the only people struggling. Every individual is having their own struggle, whether financially, whether with help, um, whether emotionally, psychologically, we're all struggling here. And that's the key thing to remember. And now um, to think about how to be kind to yourself. It's acknowledging first, you are not in this alone. Um, think about your best friend, which, are, which is usually the person you're most intimate with and you know exactly what they're going through if you share this information. And look at how your best friend is struggling. And if you would be able to understand your best friend having your experience and you'd be kind to your best friend, then you should also extend that same compassion and that kindness towards yourself. A lot of times because we are inundated with images and um, selling points on social media, we tend to look at the highlights as a point of comparison to ourselves. If maybe there's that one friend who just took the, the trip to Paris or Italy or the States, and we're, we're wanting to think, I mean, look at my friend having a great time out there and the reality is, my reality is that I'm stuck at home, um, feeling frustrated with my kids and wondering how I'm going to pay the bills. No, you can't take the highlights to be the real thing and compare it to your reality. The reality is that regardless of what we put out there for highlights, which is highly edited, um, that the truth is still behind that. And so it's good to look for people's truth to be able to identify with what their true experience is and then look at your experience through that context. Now, we're getting ready to go to break, but I want to say something uh, or ask a question of you. Very often we talk about families being overwhelmed and, um, you know, or people who have members of their family living with them, cohabitating. What about people who live alone? What's your advice to them? People who live alone, try to find innovative ways to connect to others. Again, um, we know that there are several um, accommodations with the guidelines where the six feet distance apart. So if you live alone and you have a next door neighbor, Maybe, you know, coming outside in the morning, greeting your neighbor, um, having slight conversation, you know, from a distance, of course, um, safely. If you have a telephone and you can get SMS bundles, you know, text a friend, text family, stay in touch with other people. That is very important. And for those who live in a family, but know of people who are living alone, making a conscious effort to also look out for those people. Um, for people who are elderly and live alone, you know, if you know someone in that situation, make a conscious effort to stop by. Do you need anything? You know, you need a trip to the doctor. Um, are you good on groceries? Things like that. So as a community, we should take responsibility for each other. Dr. Martinez, thank you very much. Of course, we're asking you to hang around a bit and uh, join us at the end of the show where we'll be fielding questions from our audience. Definitely. Thank you. For now, we're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we return with our second segment of Get the Fact, we'll be focusing on COVID and the challenges, the mental health challenges for kids. Don't go anywhere. Get the Fact continues after these messages.
this can be you. Get vaccinated. The life you save can be yours. This is a message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. At Belize Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST. That is 613-8378 to schedule your test today. With the rise in COVID cases and youths being infected, it is time to be safe and stay safe with SAFE, Sanitization and Fumigation of Environments. Let our professionally trained and certified team be your solution to a clean, healthier, and safe environment for your home or business. For more information, call our WhatsApp 613-0222 or visit us at 2.5 Miles, Philip Golson Highway, beside Friendship Restaurant. Choose the one you can trust. Choose safe. Save, save, save. The credit union way. Member owners are encouraged to save regularly, borrow wisely, and repay promptly. No use keeping the money in your pocket. Soon as you turn wrong, you know you ain't got it. So as money goes from hand to hand, give your cash to the umbrella man. I tell him you save, save, save the credit union way. Save, save, save it will make you rich someday. As Belize continues to shield its people from the worst ravages of this pandemic, we must continue to keep our country safe by ensuring reliable supply chains for critical components for the fight ahead. Belize's oxygen supply is safe with 300% more oxygen supply in country than is necessary. However, Fabregas continues to make our oxygen supply chain even more robust and responsive to a potential worst-case scenario. Through supply arrangements established and secured by Fabregas, our country can receive critical life-saving oxygen from five regional neighbors in Mexico and Central America through marine and or land transportation. So, in addition, Fabregas has secured additional reliable sources of life-saving oxygen using a diversity of transportation modes and countries of origin. Fabregas Belize Limited. We got your back. And welcome back to Get the Fact. I am your host, William Neal, and we're moving into our second segment for our show for tonight. This time, we're going to be talking about how can we protect our kids' mental health during COVID-19. And we're joined by marriage and family therapist, Ashley Longsworth. Good Hi, night. good night. Struggling with my mask. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. Um, Ashley, let's start talking a little bit about uh, family therapy. Okay. Does that mean that you actually deal with the family as a unit? Yes, it is literally what it's saying, right? It means targeting whatever issue is coming in with the entire family. So if that is five persons in the room, it's five persons in the room. And then working from the angle of everybody's perspective, and then figuring out what the root of the issue is. All right, a lot of times we see families bringing in kids for behavioral issues or behavioral problems, and they want you to fix their child. And so they will say, here is my child, help me figure it out. And then by the first session with a child, I can see, hey, mom and dad needs to come in here. Brother and sister needs to come in here. There's a lot more to this than what the child is doing right many times their behavioral or displays of um that they're showing is a uh, direct influence from what happened in the family what is happening at school what is happening with their siblings and no one is paying attention to that 
Now, Belize has been very hesitant when it comes to counseling. Mm -hmm. How open are people to bringing in an entire family? It is, <laughs> it is not very common at all, right? Um, we are already saying, okay, let's try counseling. But counseling must mean that there is a problem with one person. And so that's why we're bringing this person in. It's not, I have a problem as well, right? You don't want to think that you also have responsibility and in an exchange with another person, especially a parent. They don't want to think that their nine-year-old is acting this way because of something they may have also did that contributed to that. Hmm. Now, let's shift to talking about how do you provide care for children, especially within the family settings. You know, um, we're not necessarily a country that has the traditional family unit, mother, father, mm -hmm. you know, siblings, etc. So how can parents better manage this situation for their children, especially when you have, in most cases, um, if they're still employed, working parents? Mm -hmm. You're asking how they can better manage the family preservation of the family unit? Uh, and help their children um, during this COVID um, challenge. Okay, right. So families in Belize come in many shapes and sizes. Many of the clients that I see, they're not even being raised by a mother and a father. They're being raised by a grandparent, an aunt, a guardian. And we see many single parent households majority single mothers and multi-generational families. So what we're seeing in a family structure is a grandmother and a mom and maybe an aunt raising a child and a couple children at the same time. And so now you're saying, okay, how can we come together and help a child that is growing up in this household? One, it's being able to acknowledge the child acknowledge what they're saying, acknowledging what they're thinking, what they're now, feeling. that's counterintuitive for yes, the region. it is. Because we are still, larger children should be seen and not, heard, and not heard. heard. Right? Children are human beings. Adults are human beings. We all have thoughts and we all have feelings and they're all valid. Whether you're six years old or you're 23 years old, they're still valid. So the stressors that a six-year-old feels is very real for that six-year-old. And the way that that six-year-old may react may very well be how a 23-year-old may react to a stressor that he or she is having, right? And we don't look at that six-year-old genuinely when they say, mommy, you hurt my feelings, or I didn't like when you did that, or that hurt, or I didn't, or I hate that. Kids say things and we kind of just brush it off. But these are actual bringing distress to the body for the child, bringing anxiety to the child, and they are trying to learn how to self-soothe. And so they have to come up with coping mechanisms for that. Now, you know, you trigger something in my mind's eye that I think you're talking about multi-generational uh, individuals within the family's structure. Mm -hmm. um, now, with the young people, who have access to the internet, going on the internet to complete work, to do so much. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the, the, ch the challenge of um, being bullied, which is something that a lot of uh, older people might not relate to, because mm -hmm. how can someone bully you at home? You have a, a chance to unplug, etc. Mm -hmm. right? um, I was talking with a friend actually today and one of the things that I explained, bullying is nothing new. For example, if you were not a good basketball player, you would be the last person picked, mm -hmm. etc. We didn't necessarily call it bullying where people, but with social media, there's a little bit more focus on it because it's easier for other people to join into that conversation and make it difficult. How do you manage whether they're six years old mm -hmm. and doing online? and they're being targeted if they have challenges learning. Um, how do you help parents understand the challenges that a child might face 
in a virtual environment mm -hmm. that includes bullying. Yes. Our children are growing up in a reality where social interaction right now during this pandemic is their only interaction, right? For a majority of kids. So they're finding interaction through games, through um, apps. Uh, kids tell me about apps that I don't even know exist, right? Chat rooms that like Discord. They're telling me about things that I think a lot of parents don't know about. Right? These anonymous chat rooms, these games that they can talk to kids from Germany, kids from other countries. And I think parents need to kind of accept the fact that this is the reality, right? Their kids have a vast knowledge of things out there that they may not know about. You know, they have access to people, they have access to information. So now, as a parent, you have to monitor what your child is doing. And this, I'm not saying you go through your child's phone, but what are they doing? Who are their friends? Who well, are the people that they're talking to? Um, the challenge might be that parents go to bed at 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. Children go to bed and wake up. Or they don't go to sleep until 2 a.m. How do you manage that situation? Just to advise parents as well. Talk to your kids. Talk to them about safety hazards, online hazards, who to talk to. I mean, we, we talk to children and we tell them what good touch, bad touch is. It's similar to online hazards. Don't talk to random people that you don't know. Don't talk to people that are older than you. you know. But don't isn't social media about being social? It and is. that you can meet people from around the world? It is, right? It can be great. It can be great for that that child that is the only child at home that has no friends because school is over or that very shy and introverted child that has a group of friends that they made right i've had i've seen a client where she has friends from three different countries but her mom monitors her video calls okay she's 14 years old and she has friends in that age group 14 15 i think two 15 year olds and her mother monitors the video call her mother accepts the fact that her daughter's only interaction right now are these people that she met online. And so she said, okay, I need to incorporate this in your life, but it needs to be monitored. Can you only video call them when I am around? And the child happily does this, right? There has to be some sort of compromise and agreement and conversation happening. If there's no conversation happening, then yes, Kids will stay up all night and do what they want, and that may happen regardless. But if you know that you have a parent that you can talk to if something goes wrong, then that's where the buffer comes in. Because say they do talk to somebody strange and weird, say they do get bullied, you know, people are telling them mean things, or they're comparing themselves to someone else, they can talk to a parent, talk to a sibling, talk to someone about it, and they're accepting of that, you know, that, hey, Someone is bullying me online. Someone is telling me very harsh things that is affecting me. Right. Now, we're trying, how do you put controls in place without the child feeling as if though they're imprisoned? Mm -hmm. That's the tricky part, right? Be because right now we're talking about kids that are learning um, about their selves, about their identities, and you're telling them no, not to do something when they're trying to discover who they are. It is just a matter of fact saying, hey, it's okay if you want to explore. It's okay if you want to know more about things, if you're discovering your likes, your dislikes. But I also need to put a pause on certain things or I need to monitor things. You can't stay up at 2 a.m. and chat to somebody that's across the world. <laughs> you can't play your game until 4 o'clock when I'm not up. There has to be some monitoring happening so that I can make sure that you are safe. Now, we spoke earlier about stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression. How do you recognize that in children? Okay. Kids get irritable. That is something that you will see very often. Parents come in and they say, my child is suddenly very angry and they have outbursts and they're, um, they're just very hyperactive. 
A lot of times, children don't know how to express, I'm irritated, I feel upset that you did something, it's making me feel a bit nervous. They get irritated. Right? And this may come out in different ways, where suddenly you see your child saying something very mean to you. You've seen that in small children, where they'll say something very mean. Or even as they get older, they have a different reaction than you're used to. Right? So we see a lot of irritability um, and sadness as well. We, especially in young girls, you'll see sadness where they'll be a little bit more withdrawn from the family. They'll express more um, emotional outbursts where they'll say they're crying, they're feeling a bit down, they miss people, they feel sad. And then boys are a bit different. That's where you'll see more um, of the f like behavioral things where they'll do things um get angry have outbursts rather than seeing them shy away and get sad yeah so how can parents help their children through those difficult moments recognizing what it is not just labeling your child as oh it'd be so rude or you're so angry or you're doing the wrong thing Asking your child, what is wrong? How are you feeling? This is something new for you. Are you okay? It's okay if you're mad. It's okay if you're sad. It's okay if you feel some way. I think a lot of times, children are the most oppressed human beings that we have at times. We constantly tell them no. We constantly tell them you can't feel that. You can't, have, you can't feel stressed. You can't experience these things. We're taking away realities from them. So it's about acknowledging you're feeling some way and tell me why. Tell me what's going on. It, I believe you if you're feeling this way. How do you, before we wrap, mm -hmm. how do you turn the corner and not let it be all gloom and doom? Especially for your child mm -hmm. when they're seeking the kind of attention um, from anyone, mm -hmm. and sometimes they feel disconnected from you. Mm -hmm. It's tricky for parents when they feel like there's some distance already, you know, like when you're at that point where, hey, my child is completely withdrawn from me, completely isolated, they don't even want to talk to me anymore. Even when I ask them how they feel, it is about consistency and repetition. It is also about modeling behavior, right? Are you telling your child about instances where you feel certain ways and, um, you know, you make mistakes. Sometimes I get mad. Sometimes I get sad. Sometimes I feel like I don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes I feel extremely stressed out. Have you ever felt that way before? And if so, these are things that I've done before, right? Sometimes your child might not come and talk to you, but it's about still telling them the things that they can do or trying to identify who are good people for them to go to talk to. If you don't want to talk to me, you could talk to your aunt, you could talk to, to your close friend, or you can talk to somebody like that. So giving them resources, helping them to identify resources so that they can have somebody that they go to. Well, Ashley, thank you very much. And uh, like Dr. Martinez, we'll ask you to hang around for a bit mm -hmm. so that we can field some questions from our audience. All sure. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take another break. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Juliet Simmons, psychotherapist, uh, how stress can lead to a very, very dark place. Suicide. Don't go anywhere. Get the facts. Continue after these messages. I don't believe we don't want to have that sign up there in a That's not in your Chinese, that's not in Spanish. You understand why they said it? Yeah. They said wear your face mask properly, cover your nose and your mouth. Will help prevent the spread of COVID to others. Together we could make Belize safe. Wear your mask properly over your mouth and nose to protect yourself and others. Together we can keep Belize COVID-19 safe. Looking 
Good, hey guys, I'm off to run some errands. Please tidy up this place. <gasps> no! You guys do it. We got cleaners. Cleaners? You know it, that? Cleaner. It works. The convenient and flavorful way to give your immune system a daily boost of vitamin C. Just pop the cap, drop it in water, let it fizz and enjoy. And welcome back to Get the Fact. I am your host, William Neal. We're moving into our third segment for tonight and we're going to be focusing on how stress can lead to suicide. Joining me for this conversation in studio, we have Juliet Simmons, psychotherapist from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Good night and Good night. welcome to the show. Thank you. It's Good to be here. Now, Juliet, let's start off by talking about uh, suicide international uh, World Suicide Prevention Day. Let's start there. That's Friday, September 10th. 10th. That's right. So worldwide, um, we have a Suicide Prevention Day, what well, is acknowledged on September 10th. So the theme this year is um, creating hope through action. So every year we try to do, we try to create more awareness on suicide prevention by doing these things and doing more talks in different areas, creating different, you know, innovative ways to, to talk about the topic. We already know that it's a hard topic to talk about. Now, when, when we start talking about suicide, um, from different schools of thought, people say it's really for weak people. Hmm. What's your reaction when you hear something of that sort? It, it saddens me, it bothers me actually when I hear that. But then I also have to put my feelings aside and remember that um, they have very limited knowledge when you hear a comment like that. Because suicide behavior or attempt suicide is, is a symptom of a, mental health, of a mental illness. There's something more going on. But some people say it's not just mental health, it's just attention seeking behavior that has gone wrong. And wouldn't that be considered mental illness as well? Exactly, it is. So if somebody is talking about death, wanting to end their life, you're thinking that that person is asking for attention, and maybe that is exactly what they need. They need somebody to acknowledge them. Remember, we are humans. We need to be connected to somebody, to others. And if you feel lost, if you feel disconnected from everyone, these are the thoughts that might come to you. So you need to find a way to reach out to people, and sometimes this is the way people do that. They don't really want to die. They want to connect with someone. Now, because of COVID and this extended, um, protracted period that we're um, in, 
how can stress go from just being stressed to suicidal tendencies? Well, there are several factors there. I mean, stress can be managed, and stress could go, it could become unmanageable, of course. That it could lead to anxiety, it could lead to depression, and when it gets to depression, it could get to severe depression, which leads to the suicidal thoughts, which in, you know incorporates suicidal thoughts. Now, as you're talking about depression itself leading to uh, suicidal thoughts, what are the signs um, that someone is going from being stressed to depressed to suicidal? All right, so think about what causes you stress. Right now, it could be health, it could be loss of an income, the loss of a loved one. So these things can, you know, make you unbalanced. Your life becomes unbalanced. So you're stressed, you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know what to do, or you've tried everything and it's just not coming back to where it was. You, you feel lost and then you don't know where to go for help, who to turn to. You try your own therapy. It could have been alcohol, it could have been some other type of substance, it could be retail, retail therapy. All these things that are not working that creates a bigger problem, put you in a deeper hole. So when you're there, you're like, what now? If nothing is working. What? Nothing makes sense. Best thing I do is I need to go. Now, as you're talking about seeking uh, coping mechanisms, you listed out some of the more negative ones. What are positive coping mechanisms that people can also use as an alternative to going the dark route? Positive coping mechanism, mechanism that goes the dark route, you're saying? No, avoid you going the oh, dark route. Oh, to avoid. Okay, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Dr. Martinez mentioned several of them earlier tonight. And, you know, one is we, we always encourage people to talk. Talk about what's going on. Talk about what you're going through. Remember, I just said that people need to be connected to someone else. So once you could find somebody who listens to you, so then you want to be that person for somebody too. You want to show them that you care. You want to go through this journey with them. So then you know that they've shared their story with you. You want to also have to follow up. Give them a call, send them a message. You know, you want to know if they're doing better. Connect them to somebody else. To the, and by that I mean, you know, another professional. Now, when people um, are talking about suicidal tendencies, what do you... Um, encourage people to do. I like the fact that you spoke about a professional mm -hmm. because some people in talking to a friend who has suicidal tendency can be overwhelming for you as well. So how quickly should someone seek help, especially if you feel as if though there's this level of trust that you cannot betray the person, at which point mm -hmm. do you seek help or an intervention? And this is very difficult for a lot of people, and I think that's why they find the topic very hard for them to talk about. Because then, what would you do? I mean, you don't want, even want to bring up the topic, are you thinking of suicide? And which I want you to ask that question. But if you ask that question, you're not giving them that thought. It's not true. That's a myth. But asking that question is starting the conversation, showing them in a non-judgmental way that you're there for them. So get that there. Once you establish that suicide is on their mind, you want to know if they have attempted. And if they have, then you need to go to the emergency room. So that would be the next step there. But if they just have a plan, if there is a timing to this plan, if they have access to means, you need to know these things as well. And that's when you want to connect to a mental health professional. Now, as a mental health professional, what are the numbers showing in Belize um, since the start of COVID? Hmm. Of suicides? Uh -huh. Last year we had 32. Wow. That's the highest we've had in over 10 years. 32? 32. Ooh. This year I wasn't able to get the complete statistics up to date, but I got for the first quarter of this year we had seven. I wouldn't doubt if that is double by now. And that is very sad. I mean, that's alarming. Hmm. Now, is there an age range? Is there um, a certain uh, disposition that leads people to go the route of 
suicide? Well, the statistics um, show that it's from 15 to 29. That age group had the highest numbers of both attempts and complete. Hmm. 15 to 29. 15 to 29. And gender-wise? We'd have more males completing suicide, but we have more females attempting suicide. Is it because men generally, or males, tend to go the, the lethal route? Exactly, exactly, dear. Their choice is usually more detailed. Now, we're talking about having a conversation about suicide when society itself, you know, um, for religious reasons, for uh, other reasons, might look at you and say, this is something I'm not having this conversation with you. Um, because one, you're seeking attention and two, I won't tolerate that kind of conversation. What do you do in such a situation where someone comes to you? How do you not be judgmental if for religious reasons? How do you suspend those core values that you may have about taking your own life? I'm not sure if I understand your question. If the person has these religious reasons or not. I didn't if, if you, for example, are religious, but uh -huh. someone comes oh, okay. to you and confides in you. Well, I think you have to look at it that it's mental illness. It's a symptom. There is more to it. I mean, I know people have their religious beliefs and I, and I can respect that. But we have to remember that there's something else out there that is called mental illness. And that is why people are having these feelings, having these thoughts. Now, you know, um, when you say mental illness, for some people, I, I won't use the C word, mm -hmm. but they expect you to be exhibiting certain behaviors that would, re would be like the flags being flown <laughs> in September, you know, that obvious to everyone. What kind of flags are flown by someone who is, and you said something earlier too that I wanted to, my mind is racing. You said that people have a plan hmm. on how they are going to commit suicide. All right. Okay, two things there. Yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Yes. Because people have been thinking about it. I mean, there's some level of ambivalence. They're like, I can't live like this anymore. I can't go through this anymore. I, the only the best thing is for me is to die. And then yet I know that they don't want to die. They want to solve this emotional pain that they have. But they have no, they don't know what else to do. So they feel like that's the only option. So the plan. Then they create a plan. So, and sometimes some of the signs that we see, they start giving away things. They start writing about it. They start talking about it. I remember working with a parent um, some years ago, and she said her son carried a rope for like almost eight months in his school bag. He was thinking about this thing for so long. For eight months. And she knew, and they talk about it several times, but she thought he was getting better. So how do you start the conversation as a parent with a child who has signaled that they have a plan. When you see that they're withdrawn from friends, from family, when they're not connecting to you or to anyone anymore, I mean, they, there's no joy in their life. The things that they used to enjoy is no longer enjoyable. They have this sense of hopelessness and helplessness with them. And that just depressed mood that you can see. You need to find out. You need to connect. And, and just, you have to be non-judgmental because you can't go there with that idea that you know, you're not going to go to heaven or you can't have a funeral or any of these thoughts that people have. It's not about that. You want to bring that person back from what you call the dark side just now. Mm -hmm. How are you hurting? How can I help you? Now, um, the final question I have is how do you manage someone who may be on a suicide watch of sorts without bringing in a professional? Can they? Should they? Well, I think we work together with people like that. Because we could work with somebody who has a plan and who have their means. We don't always have the facility to house that person. 
especially right now in, in the time when we have our where numbers are so high with COVID-19. So we can't hospitalize that person. So we'd have to educate the family on how to do that watch for us, how to spend time with that person and clear of all the means, of course, and how to talk and be positive. But you mentioned something that I wanted to correct. You said somebody who wants to commit suicide. So remember, we don't no longer use that word commit. We say the person wants to die. Okay. Commit, you know, goes along with its criminal, like yeah. the criminal act, and we decriminalized that back in 1997. Thank you for that correction. So, someone who wants to die. Yes. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and when we come back, all our professionals will be joining us to talk about best ways of coping given the situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Don't go anywhere. Get the facts. Come back after these messages. At Belmopan Medical Center, your health matters. Come see one of our many specialists, such as pediatrician, dermatologists, urologists, nephrologists, or orthopedic surgeon. Our allied services include laboratory, pharmacy, nutritionists, psychologists, hospitalization, and operating theater. We provide on-call ultrasound services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, using our new venous and arterial Doppler. Get your Abbott ID Now PCR test for only $275, or get a rapid antigen test for only $100. Both tests give results in 30 minutes. Belmopan Medical Center, located on Garbot Creek Street in Belmopan. Give us a call at 822-3179 because your health matters. Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine? The Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is an RNA vaccine that triggers our immune system to develop antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. It helps to reduce hospitalization, severity of the disease, and death. What is the Pfizer vaccine made of, and is it safe? The Pfizer vaccine is made up of mRNA messenger ribonucleic acid, which are molecules that carry the genetic information needed to make proteins, lipid, salts, and sugar. It is safe for persons 12 years and older and does not contain the COVID-19 virus, hence cannot cause infection. Tests have shown that the vaccine is effective against current virus variants. Who should take the Pfizer vaccine? The Pfizer vaccine should be taken by persons 12 years of age and older who do not have severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of vaccine or have not had severe allergic reaction to any ingredient of this vaccine. Two doses of the vaccine are required three weeks apart. If you are between the ages of 12 and 17 years, you are required to present a signed consent form before you are vaccinated. What are the side effects of the Pfizer vaccine? Some common side effects of the Pfizer vaccine are headache, fatigue, muscle pain, fever, chills, and swelling at the injection site. If side effects persist, contact your doctor as soon as possible. Does the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine prevent infection and transmission? No, vaccination alone does not prevent infection and transmission. We are still required to continue to wear masks properly, physically distance, wash and sanitize hands often, practice proper coughing and sneezing hygiene, and avoid crowds. I believe that.
Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST. That is 613-8378 to schedule your test today. And welcome back. We're moving into the final segment for our show for tonight. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll be having questions, but I'm sure our um, producer will inform me shortly. But I'm joined now by Dr. Anel Martinez, Ashley Longsworth, and Juliet Simmons. Ladies, uh, let's just go into final words because I know it's 8.30 already. <laughs> so, um, last on, first up. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I guess I just want everyone to know that um, suicide prevention is all of our business, that we can all do something to save a life, and that every life is worth saving. So it doesn't matter if the person has a mental illness, because we can't use that other word, or if the person was impulsive. It doesn't matter what is the story behind that behavior we can make a difference by just listening to that person, hearing them out. Because just talking about what you're going through, you relieve a lot. And that you start the feeling start to come back, you start to feel better. And that's some, support is one of the greatest indicators to saving somebody from suicide. Thank you. Let's take uh, a question. Will my children pick up on my stress and anxiety? Definitely. Kids pick up on the atmosphere, the environment that's created at home. That's, every interaction is an exchange. What the mom or the dad does at home, how they interact with each other, is how the child responds to, to the father and the, and the mother. And if there is financial stress or there is fighting or abuse in the household, the child will try to cope with that in different ways. And they definitely pick up on that. All right. Do we have another question? Next question. Is there something such as too much information my child can know about COVID? It's, it's the way that you talk to your child, right? It, it, about anything. You don't want to cause any anxiety or stress. You won't tell them... Um, if you touch somebody, you will die, right? That is causing fear. But if you say, hey, there is a virus or a disease, there's something going wrong, this is why we need to wash our hands so that we stay safe. Teaching them best practices. It's, a, it's about your approach and how you teach them, not from a fear standpoint, but just from knowledge and sharing. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question? If someone is seriously contemplating suicide, do you really think it's possible for them to make a decision to live? Yes, I do believe that. See, when you're having a conversation with the person, when you're listening to them, you want to listen for that also. You want to find that little detail in there that is keeping them here. And there's usually, it's family, it's children, you know, something that is there. You want to listen for that and you want to repeat it to them. Let them hear it from you, let them hear it out loud. I like that. Any more questions? What should I do if I have an existing mental health condition? Well, is the mental health... Doc, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> existing mental health condition, you definitely... If it's something that you find you have exhausted all your individual resources with, then you definitely want to reach out to someone um, preferably a mental health professional who can help to guide you as to how to cope with it. And if guidance is 
um, not enough for what you need and you need something like an admission or medication, then of course there are also mental health professionals in country who can assist you with all your mental health needs. All right, thank you, Dr. Martinez. Uh, everyone is worrying about the coronavirus pandemic, but everyone I know is healthy. Should I be worried too? Doc, I think that one is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, they're doctor. deferring to you. Uh, I'd say a little bit of anxiety is enough to help to motivate us to keep ourselves safe. Because if I say, do not worry, then I give the impression that um, you're not at risk. And right now, everybody is still at risk of getting infected and developing the disease. So yes, do worry, but do not worry to the point that you're paralyzed. Worry enough to take the necessary precautions. Thank you. Next question. I think that was our final question. So. Let's start off with you uh, back again, Doc. What are your final words? Um, we're all having a hard time. Do not feel isolated in this situation. Lean on the people who support you, and we can get through this. Thank you very much, Dr. Martinez. And Ashley, your final words? Listen to your children. They are human beings, even if they're small human beings. They have feelings and thoughts and they're very real listen to them before something may happen as though as anxiety or getting really sad mm -hmm. thank you very much ashley and of course with that we've come to the end of our show we'd like to thank our viewers for not only tuning in but making the interaction more worthwhile Stay tuned and be sure to tune in next week, Monday, when we have another in our series, Get the Facts, a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Wellness and Channel 5. I'm your host, William Neal. Good night. Stay safe, wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. Good night.